Good afternoon. Over the past 10 years as president of the church, 
that he came up with. And really, uh, over the past three decades or so of my service within the federal reserve system, I've come to appreciate the virtues of cooperation and finding shared ground. Now, around the Federal Open Market Committee table, where monetary policy is set for the future, I've seen firsthand the importance of looking at issues from different perspectives and building consensus around new approaches. There were times during the thick of the financial crisis when the stakes were high and difficult decisions needed to, needed to be made very quickly. Under the leadership of Chairman Ben Bernanke, my colleagues and I came together to initiate swift and aggressive responses, often using unconventional and innovative tools. I think that it's widely acknowledged that the Federal Reserve's actions helped prevent even a greater crisis, and they put the nation's economy back on track quite quickly. We would not have been able to accomplish what we did without being open to different points of view, without being willing to put new ideas into practice, and without recognizing that we each had the same goal. We wanted to do what was best for the country. So today, I want to discuss the importance of building consensus around new approaches to overcoming the challenges that we face in modern, modernizing housing and consumer finance policy. I'll begin by providing a snapshot of today's financial services landscape. Then I'll highlight several recent cases where people with different perspectives are reaching agreement on the solutions that, go that govern housing costs. And I'll conclude by suggesting a, a common effort where an open-minded approach might be of both great value. So it's no exaggeration to say that the financial crisis was a game changer. The market failures were vast and well documented, particularly in the housing finance sector. In response to the crisis, Congress passed legislation to govern the financial services industry, speakers were the Dodd-Frank Act of 1999. The impact of the Dodd-Frank Act and other legislation motivated by the crisis provides uh, the backdrop for many topics at this policy summit. For example, Dodd-Frank establishes an entirely new agency, the Consumer, Protection, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, to regulate uh, financial products. Among the Bureau's new rules is a measure aimed at making qualified consumer mortgages safer for borrowers. Additional regulation on mortgages and other products are designed to promote the stability of the entire financial system. And soon, Congress will be debating the, the serious, uh, some serious proposals to reform the government sponsored and entitled Standard and Fed Act. In some ways, the response to the financial crisis has reinforced a, a long held belief about the role of government in the financial system. Those who favor stronger regulations see the response as appropriate to ensure that markets, that market operations are able to hold everyone, and at the same time, are fair. Those who favor the, a more limited role for government see the response as likely to distort markets, hamper credit availability, and substitute the government's judgment for decisions that should be made at the market level. Emotions still run strong. Consumers distrust uh, the financial services industry and how only one in four Americans say that they have a positive view of the banking system. Meanwhile, many in the financial services sector contend that some regulation is excessive and it may block the potential for access to credit and services that 
whatever you want. And I said, Can I have that? And she said, Yes. I said, Wow, ma'am, this was a banquet for the sick and the oppressed. And the community came that took the need out of the oppressed people and instead worked together to make the oppressed people whole. So I'm optimistic about the possibilities for freeing up our community through the Sick and Healthy Trust Fund. Because I do see that perhaps people with very different viewpoints come together to enact policies that can perhaps make a better world. My optimism stems from some observations that I've made right here close to home. As everyone in this room knows, this region has had a long-standing problem with basic and they contribute to neighborhood blight. They can be eyesores that bring down the nearby property values. And for a long time, the response to vacant and abandoned homes was simple, rehabilitation. This strategy was based on the principle that individual blocks of homes could be stabilized through rehabilitation of select vacant properties with the side benefit that historically significant homes would also be saved. But research by the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland pointed toward the possibility of an additional approach. We found that values in some of the older industrial communities are primarily determined by the desirability of the land underneath the structure. It's not the house itself that has value. It's the land that the house stands on. So this led to a counterintuitive concept that the best policy to stabilize neighborhoods may not always be rehabilitation. It may be demolition. I think it's natural that many people reacted negatively to this idea at first. But this, this strategy has gained currency over the years, and groups that were initially opposed to any program that would tear down homes rather than try to save them slowly changed their mind. In part, uh, this shift happened because of complementary research that showed how demolition might work in tandem with other measures to deal with distressed housing. This multi-pronged effort promised uh, to work to the advantage of all the stakeholders, the homeowners, the bankers, and the communities at large. And um, land banking is my Exhibit A. Our research strongly suggests that in many communities with weak housing markets, there is an oversupply of housing. This specific situation would not be helped by a one-size-fits-all policy. It demands a tailored approach and policy support. Cuyahoga County's pioneer, uh, pioneering land bank is showing us the right way to do this. The land bank is an entity that is, as, is equipped to acquire distressed properties, to clear title defects, and either rehabilitate or demolish structures. And this flexibility enables the land bank to make decisions that specifically address the conditions of individual neighborhoods. If you recall, it was not so many years ago that people in both the financial services industry and public sector were resistant to the idea of land banking. Financial institutions were initially worried that um, the, that the impact of land banks uh, would be negative in terms of their bottom lines. And community leaders were initially suspicious that land banks would undercut the neighborhood revitalization effort. Yet today, land banks enjoy broad and well-deserved support. 
the positive impact that land banks can have is evident all over Cuyahoga County. A great illustration is happening uh, in East Cleveland, where the county land bank acquired two vacant and, uh, and condemned apartment buildings. They cleared their titles and demolished them to make way for two new modern apartment buildings. The vision is that residents in these new units will have easy access to uh, the bustling nearby University Circle development. So that's one example. Uh, let me give you another example of building consensus on innovative housing policy. We at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland recently developed what we think are useful ideas for streamlining Ohio's foreclosure process. Over the past year, we've traveled across the state to discuss policy options that we believe would enhance the foreclosure uh, outcomes. Many communities uh, groups had been skeptical of proposals that would speed up the foreclosure process because they were concerned that some borrowers, borrowers would be unfairly removed from their homes. But we have actually found that for many, removed is the wrong term. It turns out that approximately a quarter of borrowers leave their homes before the initiation of a foreclosure by lender, which further extends the length of time that the property remains vacant. The overwhelming conclusion of our research is that it takes too long for loans on abandoned properties to go from delinquency through the foreclosure process here in Ohio. In fact, plans to protect homeowners who've already left their homes could unintentionally create costs to entire communities. These costs include physical damage to the properties and downward pressure on the value of the neighbor, or the uh, neighbor, neighboring homes. We discovered that many affordable housing advocates housing lenders, and municipal officials agreed with that approach. Today, several proposals are being considered at the state level here in Ohio that would accelerate the foreclosure process. The headway we've made is a tribute to the willingness of people to reconsider long-held beliefs when pre presented with new policy options based on new information. So land banks and accelerating the foreclosure process on abandoned homes are efforts that I would already put in the wind column. On the horizon, I see another challenge that seems ripe for progress. Finding new approaches to improve access to affordable rental housing. The first obst obstacle to overcome in this area is to shed the outdated notion about the home ownership society. I believe that the financial crisis taught us that home ownership isn't for everyone. For many people, renting is the better option. This shift in attitude could particularly be beneficial for low-income households. But we also know that there are some shortcomings in existing rental programs for low-income households. We were talking about those over lunch. For too many communities, finding affordable rental properties in desirable neighborhoods remains difficult. As those of you who regularly deal with affordable housing policy, you know that there are two major rental programs for low-income households. The housing Choice Voucher is primarily a, ten a tenant-based program that lets people choose where they want to live, while the low-income housing tax credit is a place-based program whose effect is to lower the rent on some units in subsidized housing pockets, making them more affordable for renters. Individually, the programs have their, their own specific strengths and, and drawbacks. But the programs run under completely different rules 
and they are administered independently from one another. The tenant-based voucher program, which is targeted primarily at people with very low incomes, offer the most freedom of choice. I mean, after all, renters should be able to, to choose the housing location they believe would most improve the quality of their life. Nevertheless, research shows that families who use vouchers often do not experience a better quality of life or a better financial situation. Too frequently, they cannot find or they do not select apartments in neighborhoods with better schools, for example, or um, places where the job prospects might be better. Meanwhile, the tax credit program would seem to be a smart way to make housing units available in places that are more attractive, uh, that would help the economic well-being of people who live there. Yet research suggests that tax credit housing programs have a mixed record. Too frequently, they result in subsidizing buildings that are being located in neighborhoods with underperforming schools or limited access to jobs and health care. In addition, depending on the local market conditions, renting these buildings may be close to the market rates and not affordable to poorer households. So those who support affordable rental housing programs should want to achieve the same results. Right? They mainly they should want clean homes in safer neighborhoods that give tenants better access to good schools, good health care, and good jobs. So what can be done? The basic problem we face is that there is far greater need for affordable housing than there is public funds being provided. So with limited resources, it's critical to look for ways that enhance the flexibility of agencies to administer these funds and allow the two programs to work more effectively together. Uh, let me give you an example of an approach at HUD that is fostering partnerships at the federal level. HUD has been conducting a demonstration program with uh, some select public housing authorities across the country. This program provides the flexibility to combine the funds from several different programs so that they can be used like block grants, allowing for more experimentation towards the goal of neighborhood stability. One of the benefits of this approach has been the ability of, of leveraged HUD funds with tax credit projects at the local level to meet community needs. States have some opportunity, uh, this, uh, the same opportunity, uh, with their tax credit programs. So we should be more encouraged uh, by more uh, new approaches like this, and we should try to encourage more of them. I, I know uh, practitioners operate under significant restraints on what they're allowed to do and what they can spend. But in the end, wider access to affordable rental housing by families in need is not just a matter of increasing the resources available. It is about finding creative ways for the nation's affordable rental housing programs to work better and more efficiently together. It's important that we keep our eye on the broader goal. We want people to live in neighborhoods with higher caliber schools, safer streets, and better employment opportunities. And I am confident that we can find solutions to achieve this objective. I just cited three examples in, hou in housing efforts, land banking, expediting foreclosures, and the affordable rental housing, where I, where I see cooperation around new ideas and that by cooperating and, and presenting new ideas, we've been able to make a positive difference. Um, and, and I think that that is so critical to keep an open mind and to, um, and to think about uh, different approaches. So let me conclude by suggesting how openness to new ideas can help consumers make better financial choices. Success here 
uh, could have a lasting impact on the housing market and the overall economy. You know, we now recognize that vulnerable, underinformed consumers sometimes make decisions that uh, don't serve them very well. And no wonder. I mean, we all recognize that the financial marketplace is incredibly complex. People don't always understand the obligations that they're taking on. And when and they don't understand uh, when they use certain services or buy certain products what they're getting themselves into. So in this environment, certain regulatory protections and oversight are likely to be helpful to some consumers. That said, and as I've noted, there are some who fear that regulatory overstep could actually hurt consumers by limiting their access to potentially beneficial services. Here, I think all parties, the consumers, financial institutions, and regulators, have an opportunity to achieve our individual objectives by working together uh, through ideas old and new uh, with a common purpose. The better informed consumers are about financial products and household budgeting, the better financial decisions they, they'll make. Consumers should be protected from predatory practices, but they should also be informed enough to recognize uh, what services could be financially harmful to them. They need to understand the importance of saving so that they are not forced to go outside conventional financial services into higher cost, riskier alternatives. So for a long time, we've agreed that there's no substitute for a better informed consumer. But there are some thought-provoking implications of new research that I wanted to emphasize. Making good financial decisions is not just about providing information and teaching people about financial and legal concepts. It is also about understanding the context in which financial decisions are made. Tomorrow at this conference, at the closing session, uh, we're going to be focused on consumer protection in this new uh, regulatory environment. And the Princeton University psychologist, Elder Shafir, is going to deliver a, an address on how consumers actually make financial decisions. The closing session and um, the address is going to feature the application of behavioral research to the policy environment. It turns out that opt-in and opt-out strategies figure prominently in the application favored by uh, Shafir and others in the realm of behavioral economics. Achieving this kind of financial literacy has elements of corporate responsibility as well as personal responsibility. Financial institutions have it in their own power to get in front of this trend by offering more products with built-in features that are likely to benefit consumers. Features like automatic opt-in opt -in saving plans, where funds from checking accounts are periodically swept into consumers' savings accounts. There's no need to wait for regulators to require such features. And consumer groups should see this as an opportunity to help the financial services industry understand what kind of products and what kind of product designs are most likely to be effective. So a little imagination and collaboration could go a long way toward a financial marketplace with fair, financially resist, resilient households and profitable financial institutions. So let me step back here as I wrap up my remarks and offer uh, a bit of perspective. You know, I realize that my remarks today are not likely to set the news wires on fire. You know, federal quote, Federal Reserve policymakers calls for innovation and cooperation. You know, I've read many more exciting headlines, to be sure. Lots of them this morning. <laughs> but, I'm, but, I, but I'm not interested in capturing headlines. I am interested in sharing my experiences 
professional settlement here of benefit payments, which has instilled in me the importance of building consensus around new and different perspectives. You know, too often today, standoffs are the norm. People want to solve problems, but they're not willing to, uh, to consider the opposing viewpoint. This gridlock doesn't benefit anyone. Thinking beyond our immediate interests is not easy. But the way forward, and many of the issues that we're going to be talking about over the next few days, doesn't have to be a zero-sum game where only one side wins and the other side loses. We have seen many opportunities, and I hope that a few examples I've given you today, uh, these are opportunities for win-win solutions uh, in the area of housing policy. And I think we can see similar win-win solutions in other topics that we're going to be covering at this conference, such as small business lending, and most certainly consumer finance. You know, by keeping an open mind to very different views and new ideas, we might surprise ourselves in terms of how much we can accomplish. We've seen it right here in Cleveland with the evolution of the views on land banking and demolition. And I'm confident we can see this type of of solution, or these types of solutions in, in a number of future policy proposals. In the meantime, let's join together to strengthen the financial capability of our citizens and, and be thoughtful about how we can do that and be creative about how we can do that. I can tell you that the Federal Reserve, um, and specifically the Cleveland Fed and the Philadelphia Fed, we're willing and we're ready and we're able to partner with you. And I am very much looking forward to hearing your new ideas. And I hope that you will find the next few days both informative and inspirational. And once again, I look forward to, to learning from you um, because these are important issues, not only here in, in Fall Oaks at Cleveland Oaks, but, uh, but communities uh, throughout our country. And I do believe by working together and collaborating around new ideas, we can make a difference and we will make a difference. So thank you for your kind attention and for your participation at this special policy meeting.